Well, hello and good morning, good day, good afternoon, wherever you happen to be in the world. My name is Wes Fryer and I'm proud to welcome you to a webinar for the Media Ed Club hosted by the Media Education Lab. I am a middle school STEM and media literacy teacher here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have been part of the tribe, which is the Media Education Lab since the summer of 2019. I different friends in the um, the call today. We've got, did I see Joyce Valenza, Troy Hicks, um, lots of folks. So yeah, greetings wherever you happen to be joining. Very excited to bring this to you today because Google LM is one of these AI tools that, well, first off, my friend Jason Neifer, who I do a, a podcast most weeks with, you know, said, this is incredible. You got to check this out. But it truly has put goosebumps on my arms. It has just wowed me. And it really has fantastic applications for us in the educational space as as teachers or students or just learners, whether you're in a formal setting or not. So what I wanna to do today, um, again, is I invite you to use our Zoom chat. We will have that archived as well as the recording from today. If you wanna let us know who you are, where you're coming from, and anything that you've done or that you know about Notebook LM. I want to talk a little bit about sort of just our, our resources overview of kind of what I've set up in terms of a Google Doc for notes. And we're going to play just a little bit of background from a recent Hard Fork podcast, which actually was published after we put out the uh, description and everything for this session um, that's actually with Stephen Johnson. I've got a few demos. I don't want to take all the time for demos. Uh, we've got a great group here today of uh, 28 of us here in the room. And so we will go to breakout rooms. And I want to give time for you to react, discuss, chat about this with others. And then we'll come back for the last 10 minutes and we'll have a chance for people to share a little bit. So that is the plan. So in terms of, uh, I guess I put these out of order. This is a collaborative document. Um, this is a Google Doc. And so I have um, shared this. And during our class or during our webinar right now, I'm going to go ahead and change the sharing so that instead of just commenting, it's a little bit wild here, but it'll keep a version history. I'm going to let anybody edit this. And so if you'd like to go ahead and add to this, now this link was publicly shared to a lot of folks. And so there is a chance that we may need some help, um, you know, uh, moderating this. So if you, if we need to, we can certainly change that. But uh, I like to use collaborative Google Docs. And what I have put into this document is, first off, a link to the site where you might have initially registered. This is the Media Education Lab. Um, we are the Media Education Lab's uh, Ed, uh, media ed club that meets and so if you uh, go underneath events you'll be able to read about our club which has been meeting since 2018 generally the first monday of every month um, we've got some other upcoming meetings talking about renee the rest is book in november invisible rulers and then we'll be talking after the u.s election uh, on december 2nd about conspiracy theories um, and the election we've also got links to past meetings uh, many of these have been archived, and so you can check those out. But just want to encourage you, please use the Google Doc. Um, please use the chat. Um, we'll make this as interactive as we can, um, and let's jump into it. So I love Stephen Johnson. He is absolutely one of my favorite authors, and he is a thought leader that has shaped my thinking about learning, about technology, and now about artificial intelligence. And so back on September 27th, Stephen was a guest on the Hard Fork podcast, which is a New York Times podcast hosted by Kevin Ruse and Casey Newton. And what I'm going to do Oh, and, and you all can tell me in the chat, hopefully you're going to be able to hear this because I said to share my audio, so we'll, fingers crossed. I'm going to click this link and it's going to go right to uh, 32 minutes and 33 seconds into this podcast. And we're going to hear Stephen talk about the moment he realized Google LM, which he has been directly developing with. Google Labs um, folks was a big deal. And this is this is what he 
said about that. So I'm going to pop out of the presentation and, and play this. Please let me know in the chat if you can hear this. Uh, yeah, I can tell you exactly what it was. So so I have been collecting quotations from books that I've that I've read initially by typing them up in the late 90s. Um, and then once, you know, ebooks came out, I, you could save quotes and things like that. There's an amazing program that I think you use called Readwise yes. that lets you organize all your quotes from if you read. Okay. Oh, well, wait, we got yeses and we had some noes. Okay, we got one no, we got two yeses. We'll keep going. Read on the Kindle or any other ebook. And so I have something like 8,000 quotes from books that date back to the late 90s um, that I've collected. And that is really the history of all the ideas that really shaped who I am, right? Like my mental model of the world is shaped by the other ideas that, that I've read from other people. And so Notebook now lets you have um, uh, up to 25 million words in a single notebook. Put that in terms of pages. How many pages is that? Um, what would that be? That would be like 40 books. Yeah. Right? Something in that order. And do your 8,000 quotes fit in one, in one of these 25 million word uh, documents? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're yeah. only about yeah. 3 million words. So Got I it. loaded them all in as, you know, a bunch of documents. So 30 years of collecting quotes yeah. fits easily into one of these yes. things. And yeah. what I'm slowly adding to that notebook is all the stuff that I've written too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of everything I've read that's important and, and literally every word I've published is eventually going to be in that one notebook. Gotcha. I just haven't See, gotten Kevin gotten can't do that because it would poison the data set. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's good. It works for you. The safety flags that yeah. would be yeah. going off. It'd be terrible. <laughs> so, so when I f was able to do that, which was really, I don't know, about a year ago for the first time where I can get all that stuff in there. Um, I call that notebook, my everything notebook. And, and then I could sit down and just be like, I'm thinking about, writing a piece about X, or here's a paragraph from the piece that I've just written. What am I missing? What am I forgetting? Give me an overview of all the stuff that I've read that is related to this particular topic. And it would return, particularly once we switched to Gemini, like Gemini was the big kind of paradigm shift here. I get this like incredibly nuanced response that is constantly reminding me of things that I've forgotten. And now as of like three months ago, we have inline citations in, in all the comments from the model. And you can click on each citation and it takes you directly to the original quote. Yes, I love this feature. I've been playing around with with Notebook uh, LM and it is truly one of the best features about it is that, you know, it'll show you something. Uh, you're, you're talking to it about something you've read or something you've written. And it just has that little sort of like citation. You click on it, and it takes you right to the source material. So you can see for yourself like this actually is an accurate representation of what was in the PDF I uploaded. And, you know, like what an incredibly interesting like learning mode that is right like up until now if you wanted to have a conversation with the material in a book like you had to find the author or you had to find a tutor or an expert who knew the material really well and those people are in scarce supply but now you can actually like load in the book and navigate it through conversation and dialogue which is a, a form that people really obviously like to use <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna pause that and we just listen to a bit. We've already had uh, some responses here in the chat and I'd invite you to go ahead and put in some thoughts. Scott Moss commented that, you know, he's wondering about the copyright aspects of this, which is actually a, a good segue, Scott, because I, one of my demos and examples uh, from a, a lesson that I just taught is exactly about copyright. So many important questions that we need to ask about this. Um, Joyce is asking, about privacy. Now, one of the things that Stephen does talk about in this episode, and this is vitally important, is that for Google LM, and this is not true for every model out there for AI, but for Google LM, they explicitly have designed it so that as we use it, we are not training the model. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a demo for you of creating this audio podcast version of a document. And it doesn't, as far as I've seen when I've tested it, it doesn't even save that. You have to save it yourself right then. It keeps a chat transcript. But for those of us that have been playing with ChatGPT and some other tools, um, it um, you know doesn't seem to keep the history and it's explicitly not using our data they're saying, you know, in order to train the model. Um, Renee saying she loves the ideas that interacting with the tool, um, that, it, you know, it, it could be something that really scaffolds reading comprehension, definitely that differentiates. So I want to encourage you to check out um, 
more about Steven Johnson. One of the reasons I want to get to breakout rooms and give us a chance to discuss is because, hey, we're live. And I mean, shoot, we've got, you know, 30 of us in the room and let's let's meet each other. Let's talk about this after we see a little example. And so the model we're using for at least these next three meetings of, of the, the Media Ed Lab is to have what I would call some required session media, ideally, if you have a chance, watch or listen uh, or read this material. But then there's additional optional media, uh, which can be videos, articles, podcasts, other things. Um, Stephen Johnson has, has a great sub stack that I, that I love to read. And so, you know, connecting each other to these ideas is, is important. But that gives you a little bit of a taste. Let's talk about some demos. Here's the first one. You can simply take a document. That can be someone's dissertation. That can be a paper that you've written, a paper that someone else has written. You can take a collection of papers and you can, with just a few mouse clicks, create an audio podcast version that sounds very realistic. Uh, and you can just have that with a few clicks. And I. This was my first playing with the Notebook LM tool, and I wrote a blog post about this. And this is a paper I wrote back in 1991 when I was a, uh, a senior in college. And um, I just simply uploaded the, the PDF of this document, um, and this is what Google LM created. The willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their nation. George Washington said that. And man, those words hit hard, don't they? It gets right to the heart of what we're diving into today. The often overlooked story of American POWs left behind in Southeast Asia. You see, those iconic images of Operation Homecoming kind of cemented this idea that all our POWs came home after Vietnam. But what if that wasn't the whole story? That's what we're gonna look at today. We're about to unpack some really challenging questions, uh, all based on Wesley Fryer's 1991 research paper, American POWs in Southeast Asia and the Violation of a National Ethic. Fryer's argument hinges on this idea of a PR ethic, a sort of unspoken promise woven into the fabric of America's history. And he claims that promise was broken. Yeah, it's fascinating how Fryer doesn't point to a single document or declaration to define this POW ethic, right? He argues that it evolved over time. It became this, this implicit code of conduct. Okay, so let's trace the evolution. Where does he start? Well, he takes us all the way back to the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Even amidst the brutality of those conflicts, you see glimpses of this belief that POWs deserved a certain level of humane treatment simply because of their status. Okay, you've got a link to this and you can check this whole thing out. But I got to tell y'all, man, I like, <laughs> I have an emotional response to this. Whew, not only because I'm really connected to this issue, but oh my goodness, it's just like this artifact and gem of the past has suddenly resurfaced and this, if you hadn't told me was AI created, really sounds to me like, like it's realistic. And please continue to respond to this in the chat with comments and with questions. One of the words that Stephen Johnson talks about in that Hard Fork podcast from September 27th is disfluencies. And disfluencies are the things that Notebook LM puts in in the latter part of its processing to make this sound human-like because you and I most likely are going to get bored out of our minds listening to a robot voice, you know, even talk to a robot voice. And so what Stephen describes is that this tool has been designed basically so it goes through an editing process when it makes this audio podcast. And again, I'm going to do one of these um, live here in, in just a second to show you. Um, the process is the editing process of making a draft outline and then, you know, drafting out some, um, you know, paragraphs and, and then fleshing out the script and then, you know, further editing it and analyzing it. But then the disfluencies are put on, which are the pauses or this inflection change. And it's identifying the things that it really wants to draw it and make most significant. So, wow, to me, seeing this in action just totally 
blew me away and the personal nature of this, because as we play with these AI tools, and I am 100% convinced, you know, as, as a middle school teacher and a media literacy educator, we need to play with these tools to get our heads around, you know, what can this do? What can my students do? Just, you know, how are you going to learn about it? We got to play with it. And so I really think if you will take something you've written, I haven't done my dissertation yet, you can take your curriculum vita or your resume. It's designed to really be positive, but there are guardrails in place. In the Hard Fork podcast, I think it's Kevin Ruse who took Mein Kampf, the text of that, to see what it would do. And it definitely said, you know, this these were terrible ideas that were used to, to harm people. It, it didn't just give a pro-Nazi, pro-Hitler, you know, version. And so it's super interesting, you know, how they put guardrails in this and what it'll do. The willingness okay, to go ahead uh, and I'm going to skip to demo three because I'm going to give this a little bit of time to do this. So this summer for the Media Education Lab, I taught a micro credential course called Teaching the Conspiracies. And I originally had built a curriculum builder with uh, ChatGPT. And I've given you a link to that. Now, ChatGPT will let you build something kind of similar to Google LM, but it's different. And while you can access the public version of this, you can't see the behind the scenes. What did I build? And so I created this as sort of an assistant for me teaching the course. And I uploaded however many documents, you know, 13 documents or something like that. And then I can ask it questions. So, you know, please um, suggest um, 15 different modules for the content in the knowledge library. Something else that Stephen Johnson clarifies in the Hard Fork podcast is when we're uploading documents here in, in Google LM, and I think this is the same for ChatGPT too, or also, um, we're not training the model. We're loading it into the context window, which is kind of like the short-term memory of, of the model. And one of the benefits of this is it makes the AI model give priority to these documents and it reduces the frequency of hallucinations. And it also, um, you know, lets, it, lets us focus on, you know, there's all this stuff that the AI models have ingested and they've been trained on, but we really want, you know, this content to be prioritized. So anyway, this is just an example of a custom GPT, which I have to pay for, right? I have to pay $20 a month to open AI to be able to use this, but I initially built it there. And so what I'd like to do now is go ahead and build this in um, Google LM and so, or sorry, in Notebook LM by Google. So here I am on my personal account. If you're on a school account, you're going to have to have your network admin approve this. It says upload sources. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get my sources. I have just already um, got my source docs here. And so there's not as many as I had there. Uh, but these are different, you know, documents. Um, you can now um, upload these things directly to Google and um, just let it have access to your Google Drive. Okay, so it's it's uploaded those. Uh, let's see, some were not uploaded. It can't do text. Oh, okay. So it, so, oh, so it just likes PDFs. Ah, okay. So I may have to do a little conversion here. So um, I'll open up a document. I'll make it a PDF. Um, and then I'll go ahead and upload that. So depending upon the type of file that or the type of tool that you're using, you know, different tools are going to support different things. All right. So I'm just going to put this on my desktop and I'll upload this too. Uh, let's see. I want to add some more things. So this is, again, where Stephen said you can have like the equivalent of 40 books. You can really... You can have a ton of stuff. Okay, but it didn't like Word files, so that's interesting. So in a Google Doc or something like that, um, I might have to, you know, save those things as, um, as PDFs. All right, and I'm going to call this my um, 
conspiracies and culture wars, uh, brainstorm, brainstorming assistant. Okay, so uh, now that I have done that, I should be able to view my chat window and click on my notebook guide. Okay, and here's what I'm gonna do. I'm simply going to click generate here. And this is gonna take a minute or two, and that's why I wanted to do this, because I'm gonna come back to it when it's finished. But it's gonna take all these documents that I've uploaded, and it's gonna create an engaging podcast, summarizing as many of the key ideas as it can, probably in about you know 10 to 12 minutes, maybe seven minutes, it's gonna vary. <clears throat> but it's going to generate that podcast and we're going to be able to listen to it. So let me go back and show you what I just did in a lesson with my students on copyright. Copyright is so important, right? And it is complicated. It is not easy. And so I am trying to help my middle school, seventh and eighth grade web design students understand copyright and fair use. And so here is the lesson um, that we actually did this, this morning. Um, I have uh, made a copy of the document and taken their names out. But I just created a blank document with their names on it, and they all had a spot to write. And I asked them to, in without using AI, without using Google, in five to 10 sentences, I want you to summarize everything you know about copyright and fair use. Okay, and I said, just type in, in your name. And so this is, these are the things that, that my seventh and eighth graders, you know, typed up today. Well, then I downloaded this document as a PDF, and then I simply put it into Google LM. And so, uh, let's see, this is my, this is it, this is it. I did this earlier. Now, I have gone ahead and uploaded this to YouTube and, and shared this, so if you want to uh, link to that, you can. I'm going to just play this right out of Google LM. This is 10 minutes. I'm not playing the whole thing because we got to go to our breakout rooms, um, but what it does, especially later, is it identifies students by name and the good things that they brought out. And for instance, one of the students talks about pink. You can't own or copyright something like pink. You know, it's a color. And so anyway, it picked up on it. So here we go. This is, uh, I'll play about three or four minutes of this. All right. So today we're diving into something that can be kind of tricky. Yeah. Copyright. It can be. It can feel like a bit of a head scratcher sometimes, especially <laughs> in today's digital world, whether you're, um, you know, knee deep in creative projects or yeah, yeah. just starting out. We asked you, our listeners, to define copyright in your own words. I love this. And it's actually really fascinating to see yeah. how many people said, mm -hmm. like, it's about protecting creative work. Yeah. Like that I made this feeling. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the core of it. And yet what? there's a lot to unpack. Right. For example, we saw several of you mention owning websites, logos, even ideas. Yeah. A lot of people saying that. But then one listener threw us a real curveball. Okay. Can you copyright the color pink? I love it. What do you think? It's such a good question yeah. because it highlights like a really common misconception, it, uh, which is that yeah. you can't copyright a basic building block of creativity like a color. Right. Like what? you can't say I own the letter A. Right. You can't own the air. Right. Right. And everyone needs to use it. Exactly. You own the expression of the idea, not the idea itself. Oh, okay. So think about it like baking a cake. Okay. You can't copyright the idea of a chocolate cake. Right but you can copyright your unique recipe okay. and the decoration on top. Okay, I see where you're going. Okay, I'm gonna pause that minute and, and uh, 30 seconds of it. You can get the whole thing, it's 10 minutes. I've got uh, the YouTube link here. Um, we've got some great discussion going on the in the chat. Um, Dagan has pointed out that this back and forth between these speakers is amazing. And in his public announcements about Google LM, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, said that on the roadmap to this is making this live and interactive. So imagine being able to have this conversation with two, one, three, maybe different number of people, even being able to customize perhaps their personalities or you know how they're going to interact. I mean, we've all probably listened to podcasts and those podcast personalities really, you know, shape the experience. And it's just mind blowing. This is so mind blowing. And so one of the things I want to challenge you to think about 
is how can you use this with your students um, or in your own learning as an adult learner? What could you do with this? I think that being able to provide an audio option for students, for materials, this was my first time to do this with a Google Doc, but like, and I called it the, the copyright KWL, right? What do you know? What do you want to know? What did we learn? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, the, the video that we used. Um, I, uh, I like to use what are called wonder links with my kids. And so today's Wonderlink came from this playlist about copyright and fair use. And this video from PBS Idea Channel about the happy birthday video should, you know, or the, sorry, the song, happy birthday, should it be protected by copyright? Anyway, I'm going to make an AI, you know, Kahoot or, or a little game challenge with that. Um, but then going back to say, okay, what have we learned now? We could create a podcast with that. So um, let me go ahead and see the finished podcast right. we just created. So here was, this is the Conspiracies and Culture Wars example. Again, this was ChatGPT, like Notebook LM, will let you interact and ask questions and say, hey, can you help me, you know, write this module or can you help me design this curriculum based on these documents? Here we go. This is... The podcast that it just made it it just made this 14 minutes and 35 seconds i will save this and put this on youtube and put it in our slideshow as well let's listen to about a minute of this and then we're going into breakout rooms all right so today we are diving into the world of conspiracy theories okay we're not just like you know skimming the surface here either yeah you sent over a ton of material especially about this course uh empowering critical citizenship understanding the roots of conspiracy theories. Right. And it seems like you want the full story, like the why, the how, and the what does it all mean. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. You're interested in more than just the theories themselves, right? Yeah. You want to understand like the historical context. You want to know about the psychology behind why people believe these things and how these beliefs actually like shape our world. Exactly. And I've always been so fascinated by how these ideas take root, Yeah. how they spread. Right. And especially I feel like with social media adding fuel to the fire these days, mm -hmm. it's like more relevant than ever to understand kind of the mechanics of it all. It's true. I mean, the Internet has been a game changer in so many ways. Yeah. But, you know, as your course materials highlight this, the roots of conspiracy theories, they run a lot deeper than just the digital age. Uh -huh. These beliefs have been around for centuries and they often bubble up during times of uncertainty and upheaval. That makes sense. It's like when things feel chaotic, people crave an explanation, even if that explanation kind of veers into the realm of the outlandish. Precisely. And that's a key takeaway from this course. OK. Dismissing all conspiracy theories as just like ramblings of crazy people is a gross oversimplification. Yeah. There's a lot more to unpack there. Right. Like assuming that everyone who believes in a conspiracy theory is delusional ignores all of the historical and psychological factors at play. Totally. And speaking. Okay. Oh my gosh. Wow. Let's respond. <laughs> okay. So uh, it is about uh, 30 minutes after the hour. Um, what I'd like to do is go ahead and put us into breakout rooms. And I think I'm going to try to automatically assign. So we're going to put um, five or six people in there and assign it automatically. So I'm going to go ahead and create the rooms. And I'm going to open it up. What I'd like you to do is please introduce yourself to those that are in your room and respond. I've shared a bunch of stuff and some of you have played with this. Some of you haven't, but we're going to give you about 15 minutes and then we'll go ahead and bring everybody back and we'll invite folks to grab the mic and just share a little bit about discussion. If you want to nominate somebody in your room who will talk for your group, that's fine. Or we can just kind of, you know, raise hands. All right. So here we go. Rooms are open. Please be kind to everybody in your room. Let us know if you've got problems. You can uh, email Yanti or I as moderators. See you back here. I don't know if you want to help anybody who needs to get into a room. Um, yeah, yeah. I see there may be a f oh, Do we have some people that haven't joined? I'm trying to look for them. If yeah, I mean, we have. So I don't know. Uh, Sorry, Pali, Olivier, 
rejoice, Ramon, if you want us to put you in a room or yes, you need to have issues. You'll need to click a button. It should say join breakout room and give you a chance to join. It may be, I don't know. Feel free to use your microphone and just uh, turn on your mic if you want to talk with us and share. It looks like there's only two. There's only one person with Renee there in room two. Yeah, that's why I rechanged so people can see. But yes, yes, no, please, Yanti, take take a lead if that's fine, and just you know move anybody around and for the. Let's share. So if you'd like to go ahead and use the raise your hand feature, um, I've put up just names in terms of who was in breakout rooms. Um, and you don't have to share. You do not have to share. But if there's somebody willing to share a little bit from each room of uh, something that we shared, that would be fantastic. And I think you should be able to raise your hand. And we'll call on you. There we go. Renee Hobbs. Hey, wow, Wes, this is uh, such a great session. Cameron and I had a great conversation and Cameron's doing a uh, a program, an intro to AI and machine learning for her uh, education colleagues or pre-service teachers. And we had a conversation about how she might demonstrate the use of Notebook LM by populating a notebook with some papers and then in real time, asking questions because as cool as the audio activity is and it's cool yeah also a notebook lm lets you ask queries and imagine cameron asks a question and then we see the answer and then cameron says to her 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 audience what's another question and somebody yes. says blah 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 and she types that in and so yes. then you start to see that it's actually the, the the learning potential for this platform seems to be in the interaction the idea that you can ask questions and get information, uh, that seems to be the the, the cool thing to, about this particular platform. Right, well, multiple things. Joyce Valenza had mentioned a term that uh, is pretty important for this idea of building a, um, Joyce, help me out, retrieval augmented- Generation or RAG. Generation. Can you, can you summarize that for everyone real quick? Yeah, so what's happening now with retrieval augmented generation is it's allowing us to interact with ChatGPT or any of the sophisticated bots within a corpus of knowledge that's important. And so for instance, JSTOR, if you remember that as an early database you might've used in high school in, or as an undergrad, um, it is now incorporating um, a, a, um conversations with with chatbots into the search process as well as the article so bring an article in it'll find like articles and it will analyze your article that article could be your own paper for um related content it'll create a kind of diagram um spotify style of related research but not only that um Retrieve it. It compensates in the so you're looking, for instance, for something on the Hemline Index, which is a specific term in American history, right? It, and this is something that I was talking to Wes about: the Control F for ideas and concepts, rather than just for words in a document. So the Hemline Index is about prosperity in your history and how the hem skirts went up or down depending upon the economic conditions. That's a term that most undergraduates would not know, but understanding that you can search across this huge corpus, not not necessarily the whole of of um, of, of, da of scraped data that are on the bots, but in the scholarly content and actually throw in skirts and girls and flappers and come out with the same things. Um, so we do, we still can tr t teach information literacy and search and all, and and evaluation. But now, now there's also another set of training wheels. Um, so retrieval augmented generation is hitting lots of corpi of knowledge. And so we're, we can understand what the training data was because we, we're pointing to it. So the bot talks, I'm sorry, I'm going on forever, but, but this is exciting. But what I was really worried about was the potential of multiple syntheses and the recognition that one synthesis, the one that perhaps emphasized the word 
the term pink is not necessarily the best or the only way to interpret a large body of content. And so Cory Doctorow talked about that in a couple of blog posts, and he related it to what Wikipedia is call, calling the eschidification of the web, um, because we're relying on um, a narrow, a, a much, we're not looking at a full result list. We're not actually searching the web. My husband's leaving somewhere. And yeah. Okay, and um, and there's a lot more that might be done. How do we know which alternative is the best? Sorry, we're no, getting ready for fantastic. hurricane here too. <laughs> that's fantastic, Joyce. I'm so yeah, so thankful that you're able to join. Let's hear from a couple other tables, uh, or just sorry, rooms, uh, if you're willing. Um, if, if you're willing to uh, just tell a little bit about what was discussed, or things that are just going through your head. We've got about I'll go for I'll go for room three. Yes, please do. We had. Uh, David and Shelly in the room. And David was talking about his uh, daughter who struggled with uh, calculus. And then in college, uh, started using Conmigo, which is an AI tutoring tool. Uh, and then that, then she achieved a lot of success uh, with that support. We we kind of moved to really big questions about, you know, kids who are in this age, you never have to read an academic article again or some hard text. If, if you didn't want to, you could have the AI summarize it. And we have to ask ourselves, do we care? Do we want them to do that? Or do we want them to have the skills of, okay, I put in a prompt, I got an output, now I have to read that, I have to evaluate it and shape it. That seems to be certainly the skill, but do we have to kind of reprioritize what it is we want to teach kids? Do we have, to, are we saying, okay, you know what, it's okay if they don't read that academic stuff anymore or do we want do we have reasons why we want them to you know we've all kind of struggled through those some of those articles right it's like well, you know um but that helps i think build uh skills so anyway just those big questions about what is it uh we want to kind of prioritize and uh with these new technologies fantastic um and i, I mean how are we going to assess this yes we've had you know cliff notes spark notes there's all sorts of summaries out there. Are you reading the real book? I mean, English teachers have struggled with that for a long time. Um, Joyce, you got a question from Christine in the chat about the name of the person who wrote the blog post. That was Corey Doctorow, um, some yeah, recent posts. Yeah, I'll, I'll find the link. That was Corey Doctorow. And and on the, the last point, it reminds me of Malcolm Gladwell and the tipping point. When does practice really matter? When does 10,000 hours of practice really count and when doesn't it? Absolutely. Somebody from room four, five, or six want to want to share? You can just grab the mic or raise your hand, but just grab the mic. I can synthesize a little bit what we talked. So we saw this uh, podcast tool um, being valuable to make certain types of task texts that are very dense more accessible for students, like I don't know documents. Uh, but we did have some concerns in terms of. Um, a podcast is a very passive way of learning, you know, so um, not very good for engaging students. Also, like the voice of the two narrators of the podcast, it might not resonate too much depending on the types of students that you're working with. We had someone in our group working with indigenous groups, so yeah. Uh, and I don't think you can change, right, their voices, their tone in this uh, Google tool. Not not currently, right. The current not version right. doesn't give you yeah. any flexibility to change any of that. To, to change that. Uh, and also, like, okay, if we're going to use that content that AI generated, we really need to evaluate the output to see if we agree, if it's really synthesizing the documents uh, that we um had in the uh, the notebook so some concerns around the tool as well yeah absolutely and of course realizing this is the current iteration the present iteration but the way that this development team has created this with guardrails much of that is opaque if we weren't hearing Stephen Johnson on podcast talking about some of this we wouldn't have any idea all of those things matter um, I'd love to hear from Troy Hicks I don't know if anybody else would <laughs> nice sure. call out there. Nice call out there, Wes. Thanks. <laughs> no, I'm I'm sorry, I'm also finishing lunch. Um I was uh 
trying to wrestle with what Scott had shared and this came up too in our breakout room and it's just part of the part of the air in any conversation about AI and that is well it's there and kids are going to cheat I mean that's the bottom line and I guess the good news is that you know all the data from like the Stanford survey and the Harvard surveys and whatever that no nope, still 70 percent of kids cheat that's about the same number that was present before chat GPT so instead of worrying about is this going to reduce their cognitive load is this going or their their engagement how are we modeling like how are we doing this stuff so i think what you just did today wes is awesome like you're taking one of your own papers you're uploading it to notebook you're listening back to it and going hmm that's interesting I hadn't thought about that here's this here's that here's this other thing it's giving you a new insight on it, right? It's 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 pushing you back into what I've heard called and kind of reiterate the productive struggle, right? Like when do we want to create friction in our intellectual lives so we actually learn something? And again, are many people going to default to choosing the easy way out? Yes, sadly, that's human nature and kids are going to cheat. But at the same time, if we teach them how to use it in thoughtful, productive, ethical ways, I think that there there's real opportunity for them to actually engage in the productive struggle in ways that are more meaningful to them and not just personalized learning that adapts a quiz to their needs, but actually gives them something meaningful to do and to ask more questions. So there's my impromptu uh, <laughs> mouthful thank, of thank you for being good sport. yeah thanks for being good sport as i called you out um ariel's got a hand up and then we are going to be respectful for everyone's time and wrap up here in about four minutes ariel go ahead you gotta uh unmute your mic i think sorry about that uh quick comment uh, i think one of the key things with uh using any uh learning tool is really to evaluate from the beginning what, what are our objectives when we design a class? Bringing a tool into the classroom is meant to help further our learning objectives for the students in regards to that it's measurable. So whether it's whatever you have, the learning management tool here at the end of the day, if you're giving a student to read something, what do you want them to take away from it without the shortcuts and everything else? So I just wanted to put that into perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've dropped into our chat a link that goes to the Media Education Labs website for upcoming events for the club. Again, we will be meeting the first Monday of each month, and it will be the same time, so 12 p.m. noon Eastern, whatever that happens to be in your uh, local area. I am going to share the chat. Um, we've got great, great discussion. Um, Scott's asking, you know, what to what extent... Do these tools compel us to reevaluate our objectives? Um, sure, it calls into question how we're assessing, you know, what our goals are. In some cases, maybe it raises the bar. I tend to think of these AI tools as sort of giving, giving us potentially some superhuman capabilities. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that they're not hallucinating and they're not, you know, there's not a whole lot of issues with them. But I hope that today has given you some food for thought, that it has given you an opportunity to see some perhaps new AI tools and some think about some new ways to use them. My challenge to you is number one, please connect with the Media Education Lab uh, newsletters. In fact, I'm, I was about to do a demo and put, I was going to put, you know, Renee's dissertation or Yanti's or the, the latest newsletter in and get that audio version. But yeah, plug in the Media Education Lab. It's a fantastic set of events. We're going to be uh, continuing to do the club and we'd love to have you join us for a discussion of Renee DeResta's book, one of the most fantastic books I've ever read about media literacy, the weaponized landscape. Of, of, of social media and disinformation, and uh, we'll engage in more discussions. So thanks, everybody. We'll post the recording. Uh, invite your friends. Let other people know about it. Uh, have a great week, and stay safe, Joyce, and everybody in Florida in the path of the hurricane. Uh, take care and be safe, and we'll hope to see you next time with the Media Education Lab. Thanks, everybody.